We're actually in the last week of our Beyond Borders series. It's been looking at the beginning of the life of Abraham all the way from the call that he received to leave his homeland behind and travel to the promised land till today, which is where he sees the land and the Lord says, look, this is, this is, this is what I promised you. Walk, arise, walk through it, see the promise, actually experience the promise. Um, because, you know, our lives of faith, you know, they are um, involving stepping into the unknown and living by what we can't see. But that doesn't mean that the Lord doesn't bless us along the way. We don't see the fruits of walking with him, right? We catch glimpses all along the way. We look back and we recognize the blessings or we see around us the blessings. I mean, you take a second, right? You're gonna go home after church. Well, you're probably gonna grill on some dogs and burgers and things like that. Sit back for a second and realize the blessings that you've been given, right? That walking in faith does produce a blessing, right? So we've really been looking at this beyond borders journey that Abraham is taking where he crosses a border and every time he does that, the Lord grows his faith, stretches his faith. The first one was the call to leave and that was a call that planted a seed of faith in his heart. That this God is trustworthy. I'm gonna trust him with my family. I'm gonna trust him with my circumstances. I'm gonna trust him with my life. And he did. He did. And God proved himself faithful. I want you to see this. How, do, how, can, how can our faith grow? Well, it grows through recognizing God's faithfulness to us. You see? I want my faith to, I want my, I want the faith to, of Abraham. I want the faith to be able to step out. Well, look and see how God has been faithful to you. His faithfulness produces faith within us. So Abraham left things behind. He left his, his homeland behind. He left his comfort zone behind. And he began to journey by faith into lands unknown. And the Lord continued to prove his faithfulness to Abraham. Again and again and again. Abraham takes the, his own life and the life of his family and says, Lord, I trust you with this. And the Lord demonstrates his faithfulness. Then they arrive in the land of promise. And last week we saw that was a real test, right? Because you think the promised land has got to be good land, right? But you remember, it wasn't long after they settled the promised land that a famine came and it became barren and dried up. And he's thinking, is this the promise? You got to be kidding me. You remember this? And at that point, he's tempted to take his eyes off the Lord. He's tempted to begin to trust his own plans, trust in his own way, to, to lean not on the Lord, but lean on his own understanding. That's what he was tempted to do, and that's what he did. He took his eyes off the Lord. And so he said, you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna go down to Egypt. We're gonna try to survive there. And you read the scriptures, and he doesn't talk to God. He doesn't seek God. He just goes by his own plan. He comes up with this crazy scheme. Do you guys remember this? Scheme. By the, by the time he was done planning and scheming, he had betrayed his wife, he had put her in grave risk, and he unleashed a curse into the world. You guys remember this? He was faithless. He lost his faith. You know, this is one of those things that, you know, I think should should help us realize that the Bible's trustworthy. These stories aren't whitewashed stories. These aren't highly edited stories. What we have here is stories about people with real failures, real failure in their life. And the, Lord, and, the, and the Lord through the scripture says, look, this is reality. This is what it means to walk with me and follow me. It doesn't mean to be perfect. It means to fall. And that's what Abraham did. He fell. He lost his faith. He took his eyes off the Lord. But today we're going to realize that Abraham is able also to experience restoration, a recovery of faith, a recovery of trust. He begins to turn back to the Lord. He turns back to the Lord. And this is important because it gives him the strength to move forward and actually see the blessing come to pass. So let's go ahead and look at that. We're gonna look at Genesis 13, one through four. Abraham and family, Abraham and company, Abraham, Sarah, Lot, kids, the minivan, all of that. They're down in Egypt, right? And Pharaoh realizes the scheme 
and he realizes what Abraham had done. He says, get out of here. Get out, take your family, take your kids, take your wife, take, take whatever you want. Just get out. I don't want you here, right? You remember this? So Abraham begins to return to the promised land. But I want you to see where he goes. This is really important. As Abraham leaves Egypt behind, leaves that season, that time of failure behind, where does he go? What does he do? Genesis 13, 1 through 4, Then Abram went up from Egypt, he and his wife and all that he had, and lot with him to the south. And he went on his journey from the south as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning, between Bethel and Ai, to the place of the altar which he had made there at first. And there Abraham called on the name of the Lord. This is an important and beautiful thing. Out of all the places that Abraham goes, he returns to the place the place where the Lord had said, this is your land. And Abraham, in, in a sign of worship and adoration, had built an altar. Now, all an altar is just a pile around stones. It's a marker. But it's a marker that God had done something in his life. There's a marker that the Lord had promised had been fulfilled. And so he built this marker as a sign to remember the Lord's faithfulness. And where does he go after he returns from Egypt? He goes back to that place. I think this is really important, you see, because, you know, all of us, like Abraham, all of us go astray. All of us turn from having our eyes on the Lord to eyes on our own plans, eyes on our own life. We stop talking to the Lord. We start walk, walking our own way, going our own way. Can I get an amen? This happens to all of us, right? This is, this, this is what it means to struggle in faith. And he finds himself in Egypt. He finds himself having left God behind and caused a bunch of damage in his life and in his relationship and in his family. But I want you to see this. He doesn't stay there. He's going to make the trek back. And in front of his whole family, he's going to go back to that place and he's going to make an offering again to the Lord. This is a sign of repentance. This is a sign of return. This is a sign of a man who's humble enough to admit that he's screwed up and he's going to go back to that place again. This is, this is harder than it seems. I mean, we all, like sheep, go astray, you know? You know, you're, I don't know, you're at work and you start to realize that you can make greater profits if you start doing things that are immoral and unethical. Maybe you betray, right, a coworker to get a position, and you find that, you know, that your conscience is uneasy. And you realize you've messed up. You realize you shouldn't be doing this, but you think, ah, you know, I made my bed. I might as well sleep in it. I'm just going to stay here. I'm just going to keep doing it. I'm just going to live it out. And you stay in Egypt. Do you understand what I'm saying? Rather than humble yourself and back out of the situation and return back to where you were before, you stay there. We, all, we are all tempted with this. We're tempted this with this in our, in our marriages, right? We're unfaithful to our spouses, you know? Maybe it's not even through an adulterous relationship, but it's what we're watching on the computer, watching online, watching on TV. Maybe it's because we've got a relationship with someone that, you know, we're working with. And, you know, the, the, the line between friend and more than friend starts to bleed a little bit, get a little gray. And then we find somewhere that even if we haven't done anything with our bodies, we've done something with our heart and with our mind. You follow me here? And we think, oh, I should never have been here. I never should have got into this. But i in my bed. I might as well sleep in it. This is it. I'm stuck. You're not stuck. You can back out of that. You can make things right. It's hard, but you can make things right. You know, we do this in our relationship with our spouses or with our kids. You know, we say things and do things that damage that relationship. We find ourselves estranged from them. You know, maybe, maybe, you know, maybe I haven't really connected with my wife in years. And then we think, oh, I don't know, this stinks, but 
it's just the way that it is. It's not the way that it is. It's the way we've made it. And we can step out. We can go back. We can make things right. It's hard. You have to humble yourself. It's embarrassing to let those things that are in the dark come out into the light. I understand that. But when we do, we can be remade. Our faith can be reborn. And we can find ourselves again in the land of promise. That's what the gospel's about. It's about forgiveness. It's about, it, starts, it starts with this word, repent. It just means turn around, go back. Find your way back to that place when things were right between you and God and start again. And that's what Abraham, that's what Abraham does. That's what we are called to do. I've got a picture up here. This is Florence Christian Church in Florence, Oregon. At, uh, that was the place I got baptized. I was in high school, and I was like, you know, a flannel-wearing, pot-smoking, partying, skater guy. It's pretty cool. <laughs> you know, my parents would drag me to that building, and... <laughs> I didn't want to be there. I had better things to do. I was making a life for myself. I told you guys this before. I was going to be in a band. You know? I had plans, man. I had dreams. You know? Hanging out with these two guys and got in a car and they'd been drinking and it was the middle of the day and I was kind of in the back seat and Neither one of them knew how to drive. They just grabbed the keys of the car, got in, and started driving. And Oregon's, I mean, there's not a straight road in the entire state. I mean, the place is, it's, it's windy. And so we drove, we drove that car, a Monte Carlo, 1976 Monte Carlo, into the side of the hill. Both my friends went through the windshield. I was in the back seat. Woke up in the grass. Had no idea where I was. Covered in blood. And I got scared, you know. What am I doing with my life? You know, I went to the hospital, and they, they bandaged me up and everything, and I was, I was, I was frightened. Uh, and so I thought, you know, I, I need to get my life together. And so I went, I went to Florence Christian Church, and I got baptized there. And you think that's the end of the story. It's not the end of the story. It was about two weeks after being baptized. I remember a guy coming out. I was actually right on the outside of those doors right there. It's an old guy. And he goes, you got, he's an old man. He goes, you, you are baptized. That means you got a target on your back. Satan's coming for you. I was like, thanks, man. I mean, I just got baptized. <laughs> Appreciate it. Good news. <laughs> He was right. I was about, about two weeks in, and I, I, couldn't, I couldn't leave the old ways behind. And I just went back into all of it. Um, but a seed was planted. And about two years later, that seed broke through the soil. And the Lord called me. He called me out of Oregon. He called me to Tennessee to serve him in ministry. In 2019, my wife and I went back. She's never been to Florence. She'd never even been uh, um, west of Ohio. I took her to Florence, and we went to that church. I wanted to go inside, and I wanted to show her the baptistry, but uh, it was locked up. So we stayed outside, and I built an altar and put on a loincloth and danced around it. for. No, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't do that. I didn't do that. But I did take a moment, and I did go back to that place. And I remember God's faithfulness. It was 20 years, more than 20 years. Remember his faithfulness. We all have places like this, don't we? You should know what they are. If you don't know what they are, then you need to step back this afternoon when you're grilling your dogs and your burgers, and you need to get out a little journal. You need to write two or three places, two or three times. Where were they? when the Lord proved his faithfulness to you, mark them on a mat. Go visit them. Put on a loincloth and worship Jesus, you know? Go back to that place. Because 
That's how we remember. I mean, the Lord is faithful, but we forget. So we go back. And that's, that's what Abraham did. He did. He brought his whole family back. And I can't, I, I mean, the picture that I get is Abraham walking up. You know, he's, they've been some time in Egypt. They've been some time far away. And the altar that they would make in, the, in, the, in, those, in, in those days, they, they, they were nothing but just stones just piled on top of each other. And I can imagine him going back to that altar and it's been years and, you know, the weather and the wind and other people have come and kind of just that thing has kind of fallen apart. And he puts it back together again, stacks those stones back on top. And then he calls upon the name of the Lord. Lord, you've been faithful. I have not. You've been faithful. I return to this place to honor you and remember what your promise was. He lifted his eyes away from himself, away from his circumstances, fixed it on the Lord. And as embarrassing it probably was because Sarah and Lot and everybody else knew that he screwed up, he came clean before the Lord. And the Lord gave him, gave him the faith to withstand the next trial that he would face. And that's what we're going to look at now. It's just after this, just after him worshiping at this altar, repenting, coming back, returning to the Lord, he faces another test. This is not, this is not the same test as before. Before, the test was famine. He, he, they didn't have anything to survive off of. They were poor and starving. This is the opposite. Now he's facing a test of blessing, of abundance. And you think, well, why is that a test? And I'm telling you this. Success is as much a danger to our faith is trial and scarcity. Wealth is as much a danger to our faith as poverty. In fact, more so if you listen to Jesus. And that's what he faces. So let's go ahead and look at that. I want to look at the, look at the trial that he faces. Now, the land was not able to support them. <laughs> Sounds similar, but this time it's not because of a famine. This time... It's because their possessions were so great, they could not dwell together. Remember, remember Abraham and Sarah bring with them all this stuff that Pharaoh gave them. He's just, take all this stuff, get out of here. I don't want anything to do with you. Get out. So he took all these riches up into the promised land, into Israel. There's so much there. And the herds are so great. The numbers are so great. The land can't support them. And it says that there's strife, there's arguing between Abraham's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. Now, if you remember the story, Lot is the nephew of Abraham, and he journeyed with Abraham all the way through from the land of Babylon all the way down into the promised land of Israel and then down into Egypt and then back up again. What's interesting about Lot is we never hear Lot calling on the Lord. We never hear Lot praying to the Lord or walking in faith. All we hear is Lot's there for the ride, and he seems to be receiving the benefits as well. So what happens? The, the scriptures aren't entirely clear, but it, the way that it's written, it sounds like Abraham's responding to a complaint. Maybe the complaint was brought to him by Lot, but let's see what he says. He says, Abraham said to Lot, please let there be no strife between you and me, between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we are brethren. We're brothers. Is not the whole land before you? Please separate from me. If you take the left, then I will go right. Or if you go to the right, then I will go to the left. I want you to hear this. First of all, he pleads with Lot, please let this strife, let this division in our family end. That's his primary concern. It's not how much wealth he has, but the health of his family, the well-being of his family, the fact that they're united. Then he says this, he calls Lot his brother. Lot's not his brother. Lot's his nephew. Lot is the junior partner in this family business. Everything that Lot has is because of Abraham. Abraham got the promise. Abraham is the patriarch. He's the one leading the tribe. He's the one leading the family. Lot's there doing his thing and reaping the benefits. But he calls Lot a brother. And then he says this, 
please separate from me. If you take the left, I will go right. If you go to the right, I will go left. Think about this enormous act of generosity. Abraham's treating Lot with an open hand. At the very time when he's, you know, most wealthy, thinking about coming from this background of not having enough and the temptation of holding on to what we have, hoarding it, grasping it, he doesn't do that. Something about the heart of Abraham has opened up. He's learned to trust the Lord in faith enough to say, Lot, brother, you choose. Now, this doesn't make that much business sense, to be honest. I mean, this, they're, they're herdsmen. This is an agricultural business. Everything depends on the well-being of the land. But Abraham doesn't scheme. He doesn't plan. He trusts. He says, you decide. I want you to see this as an act of faith. You know, all true generosity is an act of faith. It's a trusting God with what we have, recognizing that it's, it's not our own, but it's a gift given from him. So, and so we live in faith, and we live and we trust him. Lot, you decide. Now, look what Lot, look at what Lot does. Lot lifts his eyes. He sees all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as you go towards Zoar, then Lot chose for himself all the plain of the Jordan, and Lot journeyed east. I want to stop there for a second. So Lot looks up, sees what's the better land, and takes it. I want you to think about this. I mean, Lot, it would have been right for Lot to say, that's an enormous act of generosity, Abraham, and I have lived from your hand since the time that we left Ur. You choose. He doesn't. He could have said, Abraham, how about you and I get together? Let's pray and discern about this together and decide how the Lord would divide up this land. He doesn't. He, said, he could have said, Abraham, let's figure out, you know, you're older, I'm younger, I got time on my hands, you know, you and, you and Sarah have done so much for me, let's divide this up so you have a, a healthy portion of the good land. He doesn't. He's concerned about his material well-being, he's concerned about having more, and he sees the opportunity and he takes it you see? Do you see how the Bible talks about him surveying the land? I mean, this is like the modern day version of this, get out your Excel spreadsheet, work out the numbers on paper, figure out what's most profitable, and then taking it. But you see, he's not living by faith. He's living by sight. He's living by his plan. He didn't learn a lesson. Abraham learned. He didn't learn the lesson. So look at what he does. He chooses the good land, but recognize where it is. The good land is right next to Sodom, the city of Sodom. Lot chose for himself the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east. They separated from each other. Abraham dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent as far as Sodom. But the men of Sodom were exceedingly wicked and sinful against the Lord. You see, you can see that Lot has so much got his eye fixed on the riches of the land and the possibility of growing wealth that he puts his own family in a place of wickedness. He puts his family at risk so that he will be better off materially. Do you follow me here? And you know, I mean, if you look at the numbers, it's the smart decision, right? But he didn't discern spiritually. He didn't pray spiritually. He didn't try to figure out what the spiritual consequences were of what he was about to do. And so what does he do? He takes his family into a place of wickedness. And I don't know if you know the story, but that was a deadly decision. It would cost him his wife's life, 
his daughter's lives, he, he will be the only one to barely escape with his life. Because he walked according to sight and not by faith. Because he figured he would plan more than trust. He didn't do the difficult thing of, of living with an open hand and, 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 and generously trusting what he's received and understanding it as a gift. Instead, he sees it as something to be claimed as his own and he takes it. And because of it, he's gonna lose everything. But Abraham has learned his lesson. He learned it in Egypt. And he came back, he returned, and so he walks in faith. He was overly generous with Lot. And what do we see God saying to Abraham? And the Lord said to Abraham after Lot had separated from him, lift your eyes now and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, westward, for all the land which you see I give to you and your descendants forever. And I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth so that if man could number the dust of the earth and your descendants could also be numbered. Arise, walk in the land through its length and its width for I give it to you. Again, I don't know what this means for Abraham to hear the voice of the Lord or the Lord speaking to Abraham. But from my own experience, I'll say this. Usually when the Lord speaks to me, I, I mean, I've never heard the audible voice of the Lord in my ears. But I've heard the voice of the Lord echo through my heart. And I believe that when Abraham was there, what he looked out and he saw, you know, he had just given, he's overly, overly generous with Lot. He looks out, Lot takes the good land. And now he looks out on that land and he could think, what have I have? I have the leftovers. He could look at it like that. He could look at it and say, I have what my hands have fought for and the sweat of my own brow, right, has allowed me to accomplish this, but he doesn't. There's an echo in his heart, the very voice of the Lord that says, this is a gift. This is a gift. What you have before you is not the fruit of your effort or your labor. It's a gift from God. And you know what I'm telling you? You think, well, what's the big deal? I'm telling you, it's a big deal. It's a big deal. Look at the difference. Take a moment. I mean, again, when we get in our cars, you know, you're going to go back, you're going to have lunch. Take a moment when you're sitting down at your kitchen table. Look around. See, see what's there. See who's there. And recognize it for what it is. It's a gift. And you could, you could compare your gift to somebody else's. You could say, well, look, those people, Lot got all the good land. You know, I'm going to go home to my table and, you know, maybe there's not as much on my table as somebody else. Maybe some people I wish were there aren't. I got the leftovers. You could look at it that way. You can, you're free to do that. Or you could look at your life with faith and keep your eyes lifted high and say, what I have received is a gift from the Lord and it's a sign of his faithfulness to me. You see, we all have a land of promise. We've all been given a land of promise. And we're here, we see some of it. And some of it we will not see. That's what Abraham sees. He looks out onto the land and he sees what the Lord has blessed me with. But then the Lord says, but there is a blessing that will come through the, you that you will never see. For you will have descendants as numerous as the sand on the earth. You won't see that. But my promise stands firm. And you are a blessing. And you will be a blessing. And you are blessed. That's what it means to walk in faith. That's what it means to journey with your head held high and your eyes lifted. I lift my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? It comes from the Lord the maker of heaven and earth. He 
The Apostle Paul says, fix your eyes on the things that are above, not the things of the earth. Seek those things which are above, where Christ is, at the very right hand of God. You know, it's easier said than done, you know, because when we walk out of this room today, there's, it's like this, it's a spiritual principle. It's like the principle of gravity. You know, you drop anything, it just falls, right? There's like spiritual gravity. We have, we can have for a moment in here, our eyes fixed on what our life is really about, fixed on the Lord. And then we walk out into the world, we get in our cars, we drive home, and our, our hearts just naturally incline downward into our circumstances and the pressures and the noise of the day. It's a work of such spiritual effort to lift our head, to lift our eyes, to fix it on that which is above, to recognize that what we have is a gift and to live in that gift and to recognize it as a blessing. That is not easy because our own hearts grow cold. And we think our lives are about us. And we forget that they are about him. And so I'm going to ask Randy to come up, and I want him to pray with us, pray over us, lead us in prayer, that our hearts will grow a little bit stronger this morning so that our eyes will stay focused on those things that are above. Thank you, Randy.